This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 875, recorded on March 11, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Hello, everybody. And um, as Richard say, hello, everybody. But I said that anyway. Um, it's a beautiful day out today. It's actually very, very um, deceiving because we know what's happening tomorrow. There's a, an enormous uh, blow-up storm that's heading our way tomorrow. And all those little crocuses that have already come up, they're going to croak. But it's a beautiful really? spring day out there right now, and it's not even spring yet. Also joining us from New York, Amy Rosenfeld. Hello. How are you? I saw you this morning. You can't ask me that. I was asking Dixon. I was being nice. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I see you all the time. Dixon's a special treat now that he 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 he's doesn't come. That's right. So Maybe are crocuses you... called crocuses because then they croak? Well, <laughs> not really. You know what their main uh, contribution to our lives are, besides their beauty? No. Uh, that's that's where, um, oh, it's, and I've blocked on the name of the spice. They take the stamens out, and that's, the, it's a saffron. Saffron? They oh. brew saffron, and they are, they are largely from Spain. And they, mm -hmm. each crocus matures at a different time, so they have to pick it every day until it's finished. It's a very expensive saffron, it's isn't it? Extremely expensive. But it's what makes paella good. It's is that true. right? It is true. Huh. Um, well, tell me about this storm, Dixon. What's well, happening? It's uh, supposed to be rain, sleet, and snow tomorrow, and then Sunday, beautiful again. So, how much snow are we going to get? How much snow? Not much. I mean, enough to annoy you. Uh -huh. And it's, it's a cold starting when? That's coming. It's the way like, they say tonight. Okay. It's supposed to start raining tonight, and then by tomorrow it's supposed to turn to chilling, freezing, sleeting, snowy, yucky. Well, according to my weather app, yeah. mm -hmm. at 4 a.m., ah. mm -hmm. there's a 50% chance of something or other. <laughs> <laughs> well, be prepared. That's what I can say. <laughs> Isn't that a movie, 50% chance of meatballs? Cloudy and a chance right. of meatballs. Clouds, yeah. Cloudy and a chance of meatballs. It is not until noon tomorrow that there is a 90% chance of snow. That's right. Okay. But it's interesting. Today it's 51 here. Indeed. And hmm. it's 45 at Asbury with my sister and the dock. And it's beautifully sunny out. Yes. But I still would prefer to be in the D.C. area where it's 62 and sunny. Uh, and you can see all the tulips and all the uh, daffodils. It's 11 yes. degrees. Here it's 11 Celsius. Right. And I could watch the green, uh, the geese run around. This is all true. Um, do you, got, do you uh, know what today is, Dixon? The anniversary of? The 11th of March? Yes. Hmm. I guess you have that listed in the notes, so I, I can do. actually read it. You could. But I don't know exactly why he's making that. Oh, it's because that was the first um, major media briefing on COVID-19. It, it was the first the declaration notes. of the pandemic. It was the day, it was day one or day zero of the pandemic. Know, WHO announced it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, WHO announced on March 11th, 2020, and you oh, can find, it. we'll put a link in the show notes, WHO Director General's opening remarks at the media briefing on COVID-19. Right. And let me read a few lines. This is good. Sure. Absolutely. Good afternoon. And who's the head of the the WHO? Do you know? Uh, he's Theodore Hispanic. something or other. He's Hispanic, but I forget which country. No, there's no name here. Anyway, good afternoon. In the past two weeks, the number of cases of COVID-19 outside China has increased 13-fold the number of affected countries has tripled, now more than 118,000 cases in 114 countries. 4,291 people have died. Thousands more are fighting for their lives in hospitals. In the days and weeks ahead, we expect to see the number of cases, deaths, the number of affected countries climb even higher. WHO has been 
assessing this outbreak around the clock, and we are deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity and by the alarming levels of inaction. I like that one. <clears throat> we have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Pandemic is not a word to use lightly or carelessly. It is a word that, if misused, can cause unreasonable fear or unjustified acceptance that the fight is over, leading to unnecessary suffering and death. We have never before seen a pandemic sparked by a coronavirus. And we have never before seen a pandemic that can be controlled. So there you go, two years ago. Yep. And uh, Dixon, you you may not know this, but Amy feels we have three more years to go. Three. Yeah. Five years you know total. What? This. what happens after three years, Amy? Uh, the pandemic will be you'll be at less than one case per hundred thousand, and nice. that's where it needs to be controlled. Now, the, the American country. public thinks that the pandemic is over because well, the American public has decided that it's over. They don't just think it's over; they're acting like it's over. Exactly, but you know, a, a, a significant portion of the world doesn't have any vaccine. Do you know what uh, Yogi Berra used to say about that? Don't you? It ain't over till it's over? You got or it. Or till the fat lady sings? No, no, no. That was somebody else. Ah. It ain't over till it's over, and you never know it's over until it is over. Exactly. But the so hospital this, rate for admissions are way down in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yes. The death rates yes. are way down. Yes. So but, it's, it's, but it's roaring through Hong Kong because right. they, had a, right. they had a zero tolerance tolerance policy and then the old people refuse to get vaccinated they don't trust what do you the think vaccine what happened in china the same we thing we'll never know they'll never tell us wow that's another issue that's a political issue i don't agree with that yeah that's true that's true um, so, amy, so amy when um this one in a hundred thousand this is globally every country it's going to have to be like that yeah okay well i, I it's going to be a while because there are many countries with hardly any vaccination, as you know. That's what I said. Yeah. Especially sub-Saharan Africa. And even in like, you know, in the areas of Laos and Cambodia and yeah, the right. Far East, not good vaccination coverage. Okay. Not good vaccination coverage in the Ukraine. Oh, yes. Daniel was mentioning that yesterday. Apparently, there's been a misinformation campaign in the Ukraine and only a third of the people are vaccinated. Wow. It, so if we want to be generous. About what? That a third is vaccinated. Yes. I don't know that that's... I think, that's, it's, less. It's, it's, I think less. it's less. Yeah. And there are a thousand deaths a day now. Wow. Mm -hmm. And do you know who started this misinformation campaign? Gee, let's guess. Well, the same country did a misinformation campaign in the U.S. on multiple occasions. I think it's, it's I unbelievable that Russia. they want to play with people's lives like that. Oh, well. Well, there was a whole thing, like a whole editorial today in the Times about like um, his, his, like how you would look at him in history. Putin. Who? Putin? Yeah, Putin. Yeah. And, and stuff. And he like... And how to recover the idea that, you know, a, that Russians have a, that life, a Russian life is significant. So how you can recover since the fall of the wall. So how you can state that. And so there were like two schools of thought and he chose the school of thought that was the most detrimental. Not always. When he first came to power, he was quite different than he is now. No, he just, he just, he, I uh, know, actually he did uh, the whole trend. It just was, he was, uh, he was, uh, not as good at polishing the craft. Took him, it, he had to po continue to train to polish the craft. But yeah, you saw as he rose to power over Yelton. Yeah, he became, um, so, he yeah. a throwback to the old days of uh, Russian imperialism. 
Well, yeah, that's the whole point. That's the whole thing that they were talking about is that it's about, you know, the reestablish. How you could have reestablished Russian significance was one of two ways to reestablish the imperialism of the of the Soviet Union or or establish it in a different fashion and he chose to establish try and reestablish it as the USSR. So what is your thought about what happens to people like that? Uh, what do you so mean? Let's go back in history. Take oh, every that's what you can possibly think of. Did any of them have a happy ending? The answer is hell no. Well, who overthrew Stalin? No, Stalin died naturally, didn't he? He died naturally, but he died with the worst reputation that any Russian could possibly have. Yeah, but he, he didn't lost care. lost six million of his own people. No, I know, but he didn't care. No, he didn't. He was trying to starve out the, the German army, so he just killed all the farmers so they couldn't raise the wheat. Yeah, I mean, and then he burned well, the wheat fields. this one was slightly more, was slightly smarter, and as he wow. didn't launch his invasion in the middle of winter, whereas the other Hitler launched his invasion of Russia in the middle of winter and still did not learn from Alexander the Great I would not to do this that. It's more like a slaughter than an invasion. Yes, it is a slaughter, but you know. You know, Napoleon also invaded yeah, Russia but in the he winter. Fell, <laughs> right, right. But the first one to do it unsuccessfully. Why do you think they were defeated, by the way. Oh, it was Alexander the Great? It was okay. Alexander the Great and Napoleon. Napoleon's army was defeated by epidemic typhus. Yes. But well, Napoleon still did not learn from the lessons of Alexander yeah, the Great that you do not invade a country in the middle of the winter. No, no despot so he learns was failure from number two. No despot learns from any other despot. Well, that's people, true. People have, come, people have come to hear about viruses, so let's. Uh, they let's have. About that. Although you I do appreciate. <laughs> I do appreciate. No, no, I don't. I, I appreciate learning about history, but um, we in 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 uh, recognition of. Today, the two-year anniversary, we have two papers on SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. They're not really on COVID-19. No, you're right. They're on the They're virus that causes COVID-19. You're absolutely right. Neither has any direct involvement with COVID-19. And they're both selected by you, Amy. Yes, I know. Well, they're, they're part of a trove of papers that you send to me daily, and I pick... From them with yes, I know because you originally picked a paper that I refused to discuss because it is so ridiculous that and we've discussed <laughs> it and not uh, it's the topic that has been discussed at nausea that started by the guy at MIT that I refused to spend any more time wasting. On. How did you know I had picked that paper? By the way, because you yelled at me when I told you I was not discussing uh, RT. I was not discussing integration of the mRNA vaccine. I was like. This is the now, what would you do if we discussed it next Friday when you're not here? No, I'll be here Friday. All right. No worries. I but mean, you papers... told people last night that you only discuss good science papers. And by definition, therefore, that paper should never be, those papers should never be discussed because they're oh, not good science papers. Gosh, I can't say anything and it doesn't get back to me. <laughs> nope. <laughs> no. Nope. You, you leave the live stream after an hour. Do you listen to the rest of it? Over coffee the following morning, yeah. Oh sometimes. my gosh, I have to be uh, very careful, Dixon. I don't <laughs> hear you. What's going on? Where's your Where's your audio? You muted. You pushed the mute button, or you pulled out a plug. Smartly, I pushed the mute button. <laughs> okay, well, okay, you were saying something. Let's do some papers. The first okay, so go ahead. What were you going to say? I was just going to say if Amy picks the papers to begin with, and they're not smart papers, then why did you pick them to begin with? No, no, I didn't pick. I re, I didn't pick the RT paper. Oh, I would yeah, never pick the RT. Uh, paper. Li many listeners have asked for it to be discussed, uh, and I told I them. Would, I told him to tell them to go listen to the ridiculous discussion about the Anage paper that started the whole uh, disaster and a half. Yeah, sometimes I mean, I, can, sometimes you can learn a lot by discussing papers that don't deal with science directly. I agree. Show why it's a bad paper. So you learn right, but how many do you well. need to do? But how many do you need to do on the same topic? Done? Well, we did one, and so this is a new one. There you and go. So people have said, and I had I had intended to talk about it today, but Amy kind of nixed it. And kind Linda, of nixed it. One does not want to. She said, "Don't waste my time with it." 
Exactly. Which is very upsetting. I don't want to waste anyone's time. So we have two other papers that she sent from the grab bag. I picked these because they're very interesting to me. The first is, and they both have to do with with SARS-CoV-2 like viruses and animals, non-human animals, right? First is a journal pre-proof. I, uh, I believe it's a uh, cell. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, been accepted in cell. They just haven't formatted it into the article form, you know, the pretty pink pictures. Virome characterization of game animals in China reveals a spectrum of emerging pathogens. And we have three co-first authors, Wang Tinghe, Xin Hao, and Jin Zhao. And the corresponding authors are Eddie Holmes, Mang Shi, and Shuo Su from a variety of institutions in China. And Eddie, of course, is from um, University of Sydney. Uh, and um, there's also someone here from Tulane University and UCLA. All right. And also on this paper, by the way, is Biao He, who is at, um, well, he used to be in Georgia. I went to visit him there. But I guess he moved because there's no Georgia on this author list. I did a twiv with him about uh, his work back then. Anyway, this is all about game animals. So what's a game animal? I should actually ask Dixon, but let me tell you what they decided. Mm -hmm. Wild or semi-wild animals commonly traded as and consumed as exotic food in China and other Asian countries. That's what That's, they mean as a game animal. In Africa, they would call that bushmeat. Bushmeat, yeah. Yep. And here, do we call that venison? <laughs> well, venison mostly. is deer, right? <laughs> we call it mostly roadkill. <laughs> um, no, no, these... game animals in the U.S. include all the regulated hunting animals that uh, there are seasons for. I don't know what it's like in China. So what are they, deer, right? Deer, moose, elk. Um, okay. Bear? Bear season, yeah, sure. Ducks. Reindeer? Quail? We don't have reindeer. Quail? Quail, definitely. Pheasants? Pheasants. Okay. Well, Rabbit? anyway. In, in, <laughs> Rabbits, yeah. Mm -hmm. In this paper, they're talking about rodents, which includes porcupines, bamboo rats, and marmots, carnivores, civets, raccoon dogs, badgers, foxes, then pangolins, hedgehogs, and rabbits. And these are often caught and raised locally or imported illegally from neighboring countries. And then they're brought to live animal markets or wet markets for trading. They're often brought alive in cages. You pick out what you want and they will, you could take it home alive, I suppose, but they will dress it for you if you'd like. And notice there's no bats included in that list. <laughs> but I know in some of the markets there are bats, although in Wuhan, in the previous two years, there were no bats for sale, nor pangolins, apparently. So they say the Huanan seafood wholesale market in Wuhan, where many of the earliest COVID cases were linked. And in fact, there's a preprint from Michael Warby on that, and he's going to be on next Tuesday. Um, is, is They say is that's a notable example of a live animal market. Poor hygienic condition, close contact between animals and humans, many different species. You can imagine this is a good uh, breeding ground for new infectious diseases. Uh, and of course, these markets have been linked to uh, infectious disease outbreaks. SARS-1 and SARS-2 both linked to uh, live animal markets. Uh, close relatives of these viruses have been found in civets, raccoon dogs, pangolins. These are the most popular exotic game animals. Civets, raccoon dogs, pangolins. I don't know. They're all cute. I would never eat them. I don't think a pangolin should be considered a game animal. Why is that? It's a very shy animal. It's There's no sport in catching them. They're very um, yeah. easy to catch. And uh, they sort of roll up in a ball rather than run away. And um, their scales are considered um, uh, sort of exotic medical cures for things that yeah. there are no um, yeah, yeah. real good proofs for and of course, uh, in Africa, bush meat hunting led to the spillover of uh, SIV into humans and became HIV. So uh, this happens in many places of the world. 
Uh, so there have been a lot of, there have been some wildlife discovery efforts you know, since SARS-1, certainly, because that brought to our attention the potential of these reservoirs. Uh, and so, for example, besides SARS-like viruses in wild animals, rotaviruses have been found from civets and raccoon dogs, uh, orthohepi viruses in wild boar. But they say there have been few systematic investigations of the viruses in game animals, especially in China, where people eat them a lot. And so uh, that's what they do here. They have a collection of animals, and we'll tell you what they are. They extract nucleic acid and do total RNA sequencing uh, on these. They have 18 species of game animals, and we're going to tell you what they find. So these, this work was done in between 2017 and 2021. They collected a number of animals that are commonly, commonly consumed. Um, most of them collected after February 2020, so during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And then a few of them were collected between 2017 and 19. 1,941 animals, 18 species from five mammalian orders. Rodentia, Dixon, you need to be here for these orders. Rodentia, Folidota, Carnivora, Eulipotiphila, and Lagomorpha. The Lagomorphs are the rabbits, right? You're muted. You're muted, Dixon. I can't hear you. What was the second to the last order that you mentioned? Eulipotiphila. I'm no saying idea. that wrong. I don't know no what idea. that is. We could we could Google it. it What's Folidota? What's Folidota? Do you know? I don't know. Do you know, Amy? I don't know. We'll All right, let's look it up. Out. We'll Dr. find Google out in a minute. Fully Dota are pangolins. They are pangolins, okay. Yeah, and uh, Yuli Potifila, let's let you... They look like hedgehogs. Hedgehogs. Ah. There you go. Okay. Uh, most of the animals were maintained in artificial breeding sites that supply animal markets and zoos. Some were gotten from natural habitats, and some of them looked sick and even well, that's died. that's good. That's always you a good plan. Easy to catch. <laughs> well, it's always a good plan to, like, bring home the sick animal, right? And what kind <laughs> of illness? <laughs> and, and Amy, they had paralysis in the porcupines. Yeah, I know. They have some enteros. They have some mammalian enteros. Yeah, I know. Anorexia and convulsion in pangolins, flu-like symptoms in Himalayan marmots, and runny nose in raccoon dogs. I feel so bad for these animals. I really do. Absolutely. So they collected respiratory and fecal samples from these animals. This, these are found across 20 different provinces in China. And they extracted the RNA and generated over 3,150 billion. Good. 3,150 billion bases of sequence reads. Mm -hmm. Now, Amy, as someone who has done metagenomic sequencing. Is that hard to handle all those data? Uh, no, your algorithm is pretty good. Okay. The algorithm is pretty good. Yep. So then Just, they take the sequences and they say, what viruses are there? They take known viral sequence. Obviously, you're only going to find known viruses, right? Right. Because that's well, what you're searching. You know, that's what an algorithm is. It's based off of what you have know. And then you uh, then you find out what you then you compare what you what you generated to what you. Right. Otherwise, what do you what do you think? You hold it up to your head and it tells you what it is. Don't you put the envelope to your head, Amy? I do. Uh, I do. I don't have I, an envelope here, but let's assume this is an envelope. Remember the guy on Johnny Carson? Karnak. Karnak, the magician. He used to hold the envelope up. That's right. And he could read what was in it. That's right. So you hold the sequence up, Amy, and you could say, ah, oh, this is a, a coronavirus, right? Yeah. So and it, it, not only does it tell me it's a corona, but it tells me it's an Aichi or Kabuka. That's right. So it's, it's Ed, Ed McMahon would, would read the question, and then Johnny Carson would define the answer as Karnak. And his funniest one ever was Ed McMahon said, the answer is Zis Boom Ba. And the uh, envelope inside said, what is the sound of an exploding sheep? 
<laughs> so, I know, Dixon, you would have watched Johnny Carson. That's your era. Of course. Right? No, no, I did. And that was a, Garnack was great. <clears throat> Way before my time. Exploding. I was, it was YouTubes. too late. My parents didn't let me stay up to watch. No, the YouTubes are filled with them. Yeah, I know. He wasn't your one of your top ten comedians, Dixon, right? No, I don't think he was a comedian. I think he was a humorist, sort of like um, some of like the early Colbert. Humorists. No, Colbert is more of a. He's got a more of a dramatic flair about him. Um, he doesn't tell jokes. Rodney Dangerfield told jokes. Uh, Johnny Carson told a few jokes, but okay. he mostly found humor in daily life. And that's 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 why he was so, so popular. All right, so they found he was it. Andy Warhol of the of the you comedy could say field. That. You could say that. Really? I thought well, Andy, Andy Warhol, Warhol thought that there was art in everyday life. And that's is. why he painted soup cans and now, Brillo pad boxes. Illustrator. He, he began as a graphic illustrator. So I think there is. That. I think there is art in everyday life. I agree yeah, with is. that. There is. Yeah. Interesting. I think so there are also viruses. There, there are viruses in everyday life, right? <laughs> Why do you keep circling back to this virus thing? It's a virus program. He's a virologist. <laughs> Try and bring you guys back. That's right. uh, I'm a virologist, <laughs> and I think they're fascinating. And so do you, Amy. You can't deny it. <laughs> I didn't deny it, but you know, don't keep circling back. It's a redundant record. It's I kind think of we're boring. Uh, heading towards a new version of TWIV. Yeah, people are going to turn it off momentarily. No, anyway, they're not. what did they find? 102 viruses from 13 families, 102 species from 13 families, 16 species of DNA virus, parvoviruses, Boca viruses, and viruses, Mdo, Parvo, and Chapo, all parvoviruses, Parvoviridae, and 86 RNA virus species, Picornaviridae, Astroviridae, Paramyxo, Orthomyxo, Pneumovirus, Flaviviridae, Rioviridae, Corona, Calissi, Tobani, Hippi, and Birna. The most commonly detected, Picorna, Astroviridae, and Parvoviridae, the most commonly detected. So, Amy, Picorna viruses win. I think that's really cool. Picornas always win. <laughs> that's our virus, Dixon, by the way. That's Picorna. our family virus. That's our so, family. That I have on the shelf behind me so, here, Picorna viruses. Indeed. Isn't that what polio but, is? Yeah. Yes. Polio is a picorna, but right. as yeah, Amy right. works on enteroviruses, of which are picornas, also much right. broader than polio, right? And um, she she will have a flourishing career based on enteroviruses. Are you surprised at the wide variety of picornavirus infected animals, considering that there are very few reservoir hosts for human polio virus? No, no, no not at all. Not at all. Many not different viruses. Yeah. Nope. And, and so it's not, so enteros, the zoonotic transmission of enteros is not really clear. So recently the ones that I've become more interested in are like, are like echo 29 and C99 that clearly are recombinants of polio with a Coxsackie that cause paralysis oh. uh, in chimpanzees. That's where they were isolated from. And then they came from people. Plus, we miss a lot because we only do stool samples because we assume that everything, because it's an entero, is in your stool. Well, but, you know like, that's a misnomer, right? Exactly. If we did respiratory swabs, I'm sure we would find sure. even more. Yeah. yeah. It's a matter of searching, Dixon. I mean, polio, we found it because of the disease, but no one looked for many years. Right. 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 So, corona, so they said. Certain viruses were found mostly in certain animals, and some of them were found in, in multiple. For example, coronas were found in bamboo rats, civets, raccoon dogs, hedgehogs. Influenza viruses were found in civets, Asian badgers, and bamboo rats, et cetera, et cetera. Some were only in pangolins. Uh, no viruses closely related to SARS or SARS-CoV-2 or other sarbacoviruses were detected in any of the animals examined. Not Very surprising. Not surprising, but mostly bats, you think? Yeah, from like reading um, Perlman's chapter in Fields and stuff, it seems that beta coronas are are in a very specific 
animal in a very specific area, but um, corona, alpha coronas are more diverse. So these, they find a lot of, they find like dog alpha corona. Right. All right. So they have genome sequences of these uh, viruses they have. And remember, these are sequences. And in fact, in the discussion, they say this doesn't prove that these animals were actually infected. Maybe they ate something that was infected. Maybe the infection is over. These are just genome pieces, but we have the sequences. They could do phylogenetic trees. And they say many of them have close evolutionary relationships to viruses known to cause disease in other species. Um, so, for example, many of the viruses, uh, but also some of them were identified in game, which, which infect people, like influenza H9N2 virus, were identified in game animals for the first time from this study. So that's very interesting. It also expanded the range of bees. Yeah. Which had been thought to like be very small. Yeah. Like yes. that's why bee don't get any respect. <laughs> so they they focus a lot on the H9N2 viruses. These are in avian influenza viruses that have caused outbreaks in birds in China. Poultry origin also has been infecting people. Uh, and um, so they found that in, cer in certain animals. And they can see that the isolates are full in the same phylogenetic tree as the bird and the chicken and human isolates. Uh, now, H, human parainfluenza 2, her Norwalk virus and influenza B virus, the infamous Norwalk virus of Dixon's <laughs> early years on TWIV. That's right. Uh, previously thought to be human specific were found in pangolins, civets, and bamboo rats. Pretty high abundance. So this is interesting. They never found them in animals before. As Amy said, influenza B virus. Yeah. I think it's been found in what? Seals only so yeah. far, right? Yeah. Four canine coronaviruses in raccoon dogs suffering from diarrhea. And these um, raccoon dog corona genomes show a lot of recombination which is not unexpected. So they say this is an unsampled, previously unsampled lineage of canine coronaviruses. They also find some evidence for cross-species transmission among these viruses. For example, there is a, a, a bat-associated coronavirus, HKU8, which they found in a civet. 98.66% amino acid identity in the polymerase protein. They found the HKU8 17, which is a bird corona in porcupines. And they found a dog corona in raccoon dogs, etc. They have a whole list of these viruses that are known to be in one host and they find in others. So those are the existing known viruses. They said they also found 65 previously undescribed putative viral species, most of which seem to be coronaviruses, astroflavies, and parvos. Um, and some of these newly discovered groups had both high prevalence and abundance in their host species, but they say we don't know if they cause disease or not. And we don't know if, if any of these are a threat to humans. In fact, although H2, H9N2 influenza virus, we already know, is a threat because there have been outbreaks in, peoples, in people. And then they turn to the sick animals, sick or diseased animals, and they say every one of these, every animal that had clinical symptoms, most were infected with at least one virus and others had two or more. I guess when you're sick, you get sick. H9N2 influenza was found in badgers with respiratory sim symptoms and, and some other animals as well. Uh, and uh, other viruses were found in pangolins suffering from gastroenteritis, pneumonia, and multiple organ hemorrhage. So anyway, the, the list goes on, but these sick animals, we don't know if the virus is making them sick or not, but you could certainly find viruses there. But most of the animals, many healthy animals had viruses as well. So they either don't do anything in them or they're not actually reproducing. And so why are we interested in this? So the, they're, one of their main points is, which of these have high emergence potential for humans? And 
they they actually are quite honest about this. Which do we consider to pose a greater risk for infection of humans? And they say this risk assessment assessment was simply based on perceived zoonotic potential. <laughs> so we look at the virus and go, yeah, this one has jumped before, so it'll probably jump again, right, Amy? That's about what they do. Yeah, basically. So it's, um, you know, they can narrow it down to a number, and mostly coronaviruses, but influenza viruses as well fall into that category. Yeah, but I mean, if you look, so if you go by the thing about the NIH pandemic potential, there's seven viral families on there, right? Yeah, yeah. And coronas are one of them. They don't think coronas are going to do anything. No, in this paper, they don't. So we have the coronaviruses, we have uh, influenza viruses, rotaviruses also. Um, and they say civets had the highest number of these potentially high-risk viruses, followed by porcupines, coipus, bamboo rats, raccoon dogs, and Malayan pangolins. So certain animals seem to be, but we don't know if this means anything. It's their perceived risk, right? Uh, the other thing they did was interesting is they found viruses in hedgehogs that were MERS-like coronaviruses. It's interesting. So they wonder if they are reservoirs for MERS coronaviruses. I guess we don't live with that many hedgehogs. I don't think I've ever seen one. Dixon? What? <laughs> hedgehog? Have you seen no, a hedgehog? Was, I've never seen a hedgehog except in cartoons. Yes. What cartoon you know, had a hedgehog? Queen of Hearts was playing croquet with one. Mm. Queen of Hearts? Don't you remember that in Alice in Wonderland? Yeah. They used no. the hedgehogs for the balls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Oh, yes, of course. No, the animal rights people would have a, a field day with that. It's not they right. Would. And I've seen movies of them, of course, and the English yeah. cherish them very much so. So uh, hedgehogs are found in many places. Yeah, isn't there a big Macy's Day balloon parade yeah. balloon? That's yes, a hedgehog. Yes. Sonic the Hedgehog, right? Sonic. Well, that's you've got a whole uh, class of genes named after that, right? Yeah, Sonic. <laughs> yeah, hedgehog. but yeah. but isn't there? Isn't he? A, isn't he a big balloon in the Thanksgiving yeah. Day parade? You bet. You bet. Yeah. Does Ivan know who Sonic the Hedgehog is? I don't know. I haven't asked him. All right. So, what does this study tell us? Uh, Game animals are hosts for viruses that are related to viruses that cause disease in humans and other animals. Um, but they don't know how these viruses are maintained in the animal species. I mean, the numbers are relatively low. And so we don't know, you know, who's the reservoir of these particular viruses. I'm not sure we can ever know because it would take a lot of sampling to do that. But uh, I think for me, and I'd love to hear your insight, for me, the idea is if you look, you're going to find more viruses than you thought were in certain animals and even some novel ones. Sure. And as far, and I think we need to know that, but I don't know, I don't think we know the threat level to humans from this, but I think of course it's not. a step at least. What, what do you guys think, Amy? I, yeah, I think I, you need to know what's out yeah. there. And the first thing, I think, oh, go ahead, Dixon. No, no, you, you were going, I'm sorry. No, um, and I think it, we've fallen into a pattern where we just say, they, which is what they did. They said, oh, the top things that we think are, are going to be pandemic potential are flu and coronaviruses. Yeah. It's are not those... like we don't anticipate that already. I mean, we already know that flu comes right. from pigs and, and, and birds into humans and coronas spill but... over. But there are other viruses here, you know, the rotaviruses, et cetera, right. that we know infect people. So these could be new future spillovers, right? Right. That's true. Yeah. So, so I think, I yeah. think yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say the only thing we don't know much about is the natural history of these animals. Yes. And, and how they're being forced into new ecological situations by encroachment as the human populations increase, as their value to human food sources increases. And therefore, we hunt them down. These animals become um, adapted to evasion, and they they live peri domestically. Many of them to take yeah. advantage of all the waste food that we produce, and uh, all of these relationships are changing as the human population increases. So, 
to know uh, how this occurs <clears throat> means you've got to have a lot of people out there looking, not just for the viruses, but for the behavior of the two parties that you're really interested in uh, finding out if they get together. Dixon, what is the, the, to what level is the human population going to increase to? How would I know? But I mean, I, I thought think, you've talked about this in the past. Well, I have, of course, but I've quoted other people. The, the Population Council claims that the maximum carrying capacity for Earth is about 12 billion. I see. Okay. Now, we're up to about uh, seven and a half right now. Trillion? No, billion. Please don't go to the trillion number. No, we'll never make it to the trillion before we destroy ourselves. So there still will be empty parts of the Earth, even with 12 billion people. Sure. And there will absolutely. be a lot of wild animals there. No so. question. Okay. So they conclude that the viruses in this study fall into two categories, those with restricted host range and those with cap capability to infect animals from different mammalian orders that seem to overcome host genetic barriers. And they say the latter is the ones that are the ones that we should pay more attention to because they're more likely to jump into people. I think that's fair. All right. Did you enjoy that, Dixon? Yes, I did. But I've also, um, you know, as you guys talk about these specific situations in China, I also think about all of the outbreaks that have occurred in sub-Saharan Africa over the last 25 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. And those are new viruses that would, would never have been thought of as infecting people before. And all of a sudden now they're commonly occurring. Yeah. So you've got outbreaks of uh, loss of fever and Ebola, of course, and uh, West Nile, a lot of those viruses were slow to be recognized. And uh, we still don't understand the ecological relationships that bring us together with them. I want to show you the, um, ah. uh, it's not the right thing I'm doing here, but where can, <laughs> how can I bring this up? Okay, there we go. So that's um, figure, one of the figures of the paper, which shows you know, where these animals were sampled throughout China in the phylogenetic trees of the uh, animals that were sampled. But here are some pictures of these, of these animals here. So you can see some of them are very cute. They're all spiny well, and well, cute. Well, they were endemic also. The raccoon and dog you, is uh, an animal that isn't found in too many places. And look at this. This is the gamey taste price list. So this is the price for all of these animals. It's all in Chinese, right. so you can't right. tell. But not clear to me why why people want to eat that. Do you guys do you guys understand this uh, propensity? Well, cuisines are very difficult to understand. Or is that a cultural thing that we're not going to understand? Absolutely. I mean, well, no, no. You can talk about it, but um, I think that there are some cultures that eat everything, and some cultures that eat very few things. Uh -huh. And um, you can go around the world and find, you know, like Eskimos, for instance, their diets are very limited by the availability of wild animals. And there are too many that have um, evolved to live in the Arctic. And um, so, therefore, their, their food choices are limited. And uh, that's why they store, you know, when the fish run up the rivers, they gather them, they dry them down so that they'll have a food source. Uh, and it's a very boring diet, whereas a country like China, with the number of trade routes and all the history, yeah. have uh, been able to sample basically whatever walks, crawls, flies, or swims. And you see that in Africa a lot as well. Let me ask you a more philosophical question. So it's clear that wet markets are dangerous for spillovers, right? I would right? say so. I would you think we will, so. they will ever be eliminated or is that something that will exist always well i mean even in the united states where we've got a fairly enlightened uh, food inspection system if you go to places like chinatowns in various cities you can see fish tanks filled with exotic fish that we wouldn't ordinarily consider to be a, a live food item that you can pick mm -hmm. out of a tank yeah i've even yeah. seen turtles right and uh, lots of other um non-swimming animals that you can buy live. But that's a culture that's been moved over to our country from another country where that's common. 
Yeah, but that's <laughs> that's just one of them. I mean, many. I, yeah, well, many. yeah, I mean, but that's one example from China. I mean, I could go to some sections of Brooklyn and buy a live chicken and have yeah, them pick it out well, that is true. That's right. and have it that's right. cut and defeathered right. and pick it You're up right. today, right? Yeah, Tomorrow, yeah like true. an hour later. So yeah. out west, you can buy live stock and have it slaughtered for you. Yeah, could probably buy snakes, so. right? Get them. Slaughtered crocodile, food. alligator, all down south. That's true. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't think we should uh, judge and other Australia, cultures. Australia's got a wild. I mean, they've got uh, feral pigs to choose from, and lots of different species of kangaroos that they uh, yeah hunt. I mean, I agree. We times. shouldn't, we shouldn't cast aspersions, but Not at all. these particular ones. Twice now in, in China have been the origin of so of what viruses. we know about of what we know about yeah so, so all yeah. these others could have been origins of stuff that we don't we don't know about of so course. I wouldn't I wouldn't judge them and I wouldn't say anything and the fact is is that you know because we live here in a Carter where we can go to you know a fromage and a bread bakery and a butcher and then a, a fish, a fishmonger and stuff, you know, where it's all nicely selected out for us and everything is not the way that most people live. So I think we I understand. are, understand. I think we have to uh, be more accepting of diversity. That's why travel is so important because when my wife and I used to take our annual trips around Christmas, uh, one of our favorite destinations was Southeast Asia, and one of our favorite countries was Thailand. And Thailand has more live markets for more exotic animals. I, yeah, I even saw water bugs. I mean, not the cockroaches that we refer to as water bugs, but real water bugs that were sort of bounded up with rubber bands to keep their proboscis from stabbing the uh, procurer of such exotic food items. How they ate them, I have no idea. But there were large bins filled with mealworms and all kinds of exotic beetle larvae and things that I had never seen before for sale. And uh, uh, so, how do we reduce the risk? Then we ah, that's a good question. That's a great question. I agree. So you're saying we should let them be, but all right, we have to reduce the risk. So maybe when a new virus emerges, we should be ready for it instead of. Well, eliminating being ready means that you're going to be ready for everything, right? Because how would you know yeah. which one is next? Well, as Amy said, I'd, flu and coronas are the big ones, right? Be ready for those. Yeah, that's true. And we used to have a lot of others that we've eliminated by vaccination, right? So I think we're making some progress. Okay. And anyway, the next paper is actually relevant to this also. It's a, it's a nature paper. ACE2 binding is an ancestral and evolvable trait of sarbecoviruses. This comes from um, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and University of uh, Washington, Tyler Starr, Samantha Zapeta, Alexandra Walls, Allison Greeny, Sergei Alkovsky, David Wiesler, and Jesse Bloom. Vincent, I've been on this show for a long time with you. Yes. And I've never heard the term Sarbeco virus. What is it? It's the, it's the beta coronavirus genus, right, Amy? Yes. What so is, we have what four. What does Sarbeco refer to? Uh, so there are four genera of coronas alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and this is the betas. The and then they're divided. They're divided, and this is like the SARS-related beta corona. Yes, ah, SARS beta it, I got it, I got it. corona. There you got go. It, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, okay. I mean, I have a little bit of an issue with this. Okay. The premise okay. of what they do. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I agree. But so this is looking at ACE2 spike ACE2 interaction, and particularly receptor binding domain part of spike in ACE2, and the the whole paper is focused on that. Of course, that is not the only thing that controls infection. But well, not only that, but it's just very unclear to me that ACE2 is in the digestive tract of the bat. Uh, you're not sure if it's in the digestive tract? 
try, yeah. Why is that? Because these are these viruses are gastrointestinal are gastrointestinal pathogens of the right. bat. Right. So they have to be replicating in some cell within the gastrointestinal tract, right? So they rec they do everything, and then they talk about binding to bat ACE two, and it's not clear to me that that's a physiologically relevant analogy because if it's not found in the tissue then I don't care. So it's not known if it's the protein. I don't believe that I don't believe that is two is in the gut. Okay. All right. Well I'm not even clear it's in our gut. It has to reproduce somewhere in the bat, right? Because these are isolated from bats, correct? Right. So either we have decided either we have completely mischaracterized the disease that the bat gets. And these are respiratory viruses, although I really would find that hard to believe with the amount that we capture from guano. Or yeah. they're not using ace bat, or they're not using ace bat too. Interesting. But obviously, I mean, they- otherwise, how do you explain it? No, if the receptor point. is not in the tissue that, that the virus is replicating in, how is it getting into the cell? It seems to me that someone must have looked throughout the entire tract of bats, right? Well, we can Google it. All right. Well, while you're Googling it, let me yeah, tell you that this I'm is Googling about. Um, so, as you know, SARS CoV 2 and SARS CoV 1 both bind ACE 2. Uh, and um, all before the emergence of SARS CoV 2, all bats are beckos um, with an ability to bind any ACE 2 had. Receptor binding domains related to SARS-CoV-1. And these are from Rhinolophus sinicus and Affinis bats in Yunnan in southwest China. More recently, these virus, these uh, viruses that can bind ACE2 have been found more widely across Asia from a, a wider diversity of uh, Rhinolophus bats. But um, ACE2 binding has not been observed within a group of Sarbeco RBDs sampled in Southeast Asia. Clade 2, that's called. We'll come back to that. Uh, nor, and this is interesting, nor in distantly related Sarbeckos from Africa and Europe. That's clade three. So they say it's not clear whether ACE2 binding is an ancestral trait of Sarbeckos uh, that's been lost, or is it a trait that was acquired more recently in a subset of Asian Sarbeco RBDs? And so that's what they're trying to address in this paper. So they do it in a very high throughput manner by they make a gene library of 45 Sarbeco virus receptor binding domains spanning all four, all four known clades uh, of uh, Sarbeco viruses, 45 different receptor binding domains. They put the genes encoding these RBDs into a yeast uh, library that will put the protein on the surface of yeast cells, Saccharomyces, right? Yeah. And then you can ask, do the cells bind ACE2? Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. And you have ACE2 and you have a fluorescent label and then you can do flow cytometry and measure binding. It's quite nice, cool. right? Cool. So ACE2, they think, may be on the surface of a few enterocytes. Okay. Huh. In bats? No, in humans. It, okay. it, it doesn't talk about where it is in, in bats. But not of, so maybe at the very beginning of the small intestine, the duodenum, but not of the colon. All right. And then it would be underneath the basal laminal layer, maybe in the, um, what, I guess the epithelial lining that would be, or the, uh, yeah, the vasculature lining at the bottom of the, uh, underneath the basal lamina. Yeah. Okay. So then they take the ACE2 proteins. They're looking at proteins from humans, civets, pangolin, mice, and bats. Two bats, uh, Rhinolophus affinis and Rhinolophus sinicus. And they say, do these ACE2s and the RBDs interact in this yeast assay, assay? And they can do dissociation constant and measure the affinity. So of each RBD for each of the eight ACE2 orthologs. Okay. So, what do they find? Human ACE2 binding is restricted to RBDs within the SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 clades. 
Although within those, they see variation. So RBDs from SARS-CoV-2s from pangolins, they bind ACE2 with high affinity, while those from, from RATG13, a Rhinolophus affinis bat isolate bats, uh, have uh, lower affinity. SARS-CoV-1 uh, bind ACE2 very strongly, uh, but RBDs from civet and sporadic 2004 human isolates show weaker binding. Uh, and they say this is consistent with their civet origin and limited transmission. SARS-CoV-1 related bat virus RBDs bind human ACE2 in some cases with higher affinity than SARS-CoV-1 itself. Interesting. Uh, pangolin ACE2 binding is more widespread within the SARS-CoV-2 clade. Um, and then they say RBDs from SARS-CoV-1 and 2 clades only bind mouse ACE2 sporadically. And we know that mice are not natural hosts of these viruses. Uh, binding of ACE2 to, to the bat. Um, Binding of, of ACE2 from bats, R. R. affinis and R. scenicus, vary sharply among uh, SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. Um, and then the, what I think is interesting to them is that they have a virus from Kenya, a Sarbeco from Kenya, BTKY72. It binds Rhinolophus affinis ACE2, um, which is the first described binding of any Sarbeco outside of Asia. I always wondered, Amy, why these don't bind ACE2. But yep. if you look, I guess you find it, right? Yep. And they actually purified the proteins and produced them and characterized their binding. They also made pseudotype viruses uh, with the RBD and showed that, in fact, it can uh, allow virus entry. It's a bona fide receptor interaction. So BK, BTKY72 may bind ACE2 from bats in Africa. Because uh not sure if, I don't think our affinis is uh, in Africa, right? No, it's not. Yeah. The horseshoe bat is not in Africa. It's different. But this virus was from a, a, bat, a virus. It was in Kenya from some bat, right? Yeah. They didn't find ACE2 binding by any of the clade 2 receptor binding domains. I have to remind you what clade two was. Clade two are uh, all these um, viruses sampled in Southeast Asia, the rather prevalent viruses that we've talked about before on Twitter. So no um, binding to ACE2. Uh, they also tested binding by uh, two RBDs from Rhinolophus sinicus, and these are from these are YN 2013 from Yunnan and HKU3-1 from HK, Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Um, and they did not bind to any of the eight uh, Sinicus ACE2 alleles. These, these uh, clade 2 RBDs have deletions in the receptor binding motif, and that may account for it. So basically, they found that this, this Kenyan virus... Uh, binding to ACE2 suggests that a binding is present in an ancestor of all Sarbeco's prior to the split of Asian and non-Asian RBD clades, right? Uh, so they wanted to test this idea um, and they do a computer reconstruction. It's called an ancestral sequence reconstruction to try and infer plausible sequences uh, re representing ancestral nodes on the phylogenetic tree of the Sarbeco virus receptor binding domain. So they want to know what are the ancestors? Can we predict what they might be by these computational methods? And they do it and they can find that, and they can test the binding of these reconstructed ancestors. And they find that the reconstructed ancestors of all Sarbeco virus receptor binding domains can bind the rhinolophus, uh, a rhinolophus ACE2 allele. Now, they also can lose binding uh, in, in their reconstructions as well um, because they make a lot of amino acid deletions and changes in doing these reconstructions. So you can also lose it on the way. So the ancestral virus RBD seems to have it. And, and then, of course, this is a prediction. We don't know if this actually exists. And they say 
Statistical uncertainty impacts our inferences, but our hypothesis of ancestral origin of ACE2 binding is supported by it. So I don't know if this is correct or not, but the idea is that uh, you had an ACE2 binding in the ancestor to all these Sarbeco viruses. So then the, the next set of experiments is actually the title of the paper. C could you evolve ACE2 binding by single amino acid changes in the RBD? So you take all of your RBD sequences and you make single amino acid changes at one of six positions that are important in the interaction with uh, uh, ACE2. And then they measure binding. And basically they say that you can make make uh, a single RBDs. amino acid a single amino acid change you can make single amino acid changes that will allow ACE2 binding from a RBD that does not bind ACE2 to begin with uh, in most in a majority of cases where an RBD does not bind a particular ACE2 single changes can confer low to moderate binding single amino acid changes and there are multiple ways multiple evolutionary paths to acquiring uh, this binding so this BTKY72 RBD from Kenya, which can bind BAT, ACE2, they said single amino acid changes at three positions can enable binding to human ACE2. So they say this suggests that human ACE2 binding is evolutionarily accessible in this lineage. And they validate these, these findings by making the proteins and doing uh, – Lenti, uh, pseudotype viruses to verify that they could bind human ACE2 and get into cells. So um, I think that's quite interesting. And finally, um, there are a number of unsampled Sarbeco virus lineages uh, out there and they um, say, can these bind human ACE2? Uh, or, or have they lost it? So they investigated Sarbeco virus reported after the initiation of this work uh, and determined ACE2 binding of, of these uh, RBDs using this, this yeast assay. They have two newly described Sarbeco viruses from Russia uh, that bind ACE2 of bats. One binds Rhinolophus affinis. Uh, Costa, one of them, Costa R2, binds to human ACE2 even in the absence of mutation. It's interesting. Uh, and this has been shown by others to allow cell entry via human ACE2. And so they say this, the evolvability of human ACE2 binding that we describe for other Sarbacos has been realized in naturally circulating viruses that are separated uh, from the Asian clades. And also that you can get ACE2 binding uh, outside of Southeast Asia. Ancestral viruses bind ACE2 and they can evolve human ACE2 binding by single amino acid changes. Uh, and they say that these findings illustrate that the ancestral traits of ACE2 binding and evolvability to human ACE2 binding are maintained in geographically and phylogenetically diverse Sarbeco viruses, including lineages that are just beginning to be described. So ACE2 binding is ancestral and it can easily change to bind human ACE2 and, and viruses carrying these RBDs are in many parts of the world, not just in Southeast Asia. Well, we know that from uh, uh, all the other papers that we've done on TWIF that I've selected that they actually span, what, that 1,400 kilometer distance from yeah. Japan all the way down to, what was it, Malaysia or Laos, whatever. Yeah, I forgot it's now. correct. And Malaysia, Laos, Thailand as well, yeah. Right. And I always said that there were caves in, Af in the southern part of Russia and the Transylvanian section of Hungary and Czech that had these bats. Yeah. So, I mean, that doesn't mean that SARS-CoV-2 originated there, but similar outbreaks could occur from other places in the world, right? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't even mean that you're going to find a cave that, a single cave that SARS-CoV-2 came from. You're yeah. not going to find a single cave that SARS-CoV-2 came from. 
So they say, the last thing I want to make a point of, they say, although human infectivity depends on many factors, the ability to bind the receptor is certainly a key. And so, yes, it's necessary, but not sufficient. The cell has to also support uh, virus replication. So, you know, just getting it isn't the whole story. So just because these viruses could get into human cells doesn't mean they will reproduce. Many other things have to be aligned. So, I mean, I think that's how we often do science. We do a reductionist approach. We take individual steps and dissect them and study them, but you have to maintain the big picture. You have to do a reductionist approach. Yeah. You can't do everything at once. I was going to say, <laughs> if you have too many changes, you can't understand yeah. anything. So we know from this that the, you know, binding and even some cell entry in some cases can be widespread and easily evolvable. But what about infectivity in human cells? That's a whole nother story. And this does not address that. Nevertheless, uh, their last sentence I think is important. Efforts to develop vaccines and antibody therapeutics for pandemic preparedness should consider Sarbeco viruses circulating worldwide. Would you agree with that, Amy? Yeah, for sure. So, you yeah, we need, need to this. have you need to have a pan something or other, right? Pan Sarbeco from all over the world and then look at everything and make antibodies and antivirals based on them, not just the spike, but also other proteins as well. Yes. Got that, Dixon? Got it. He's muted. A lot of no, he's not. So Dixon, oh. the binding to ACE2 is old and it can evolve very easily. Single amino acid changes to allow binding to human ACE2. Yep. Yeah, well, single amino acid changes could also cause it to lose its ability. And also to cause bind. it to lose it. Absolutely right. It so, Amy, what, what is the – is this random, Amy, that human ACE2 binding arises? Because there's no human ACE2 in the woods, right? Yeah, it's probably random. Because they pull out some of the same alter the same sites like 501 and 498, which I believe were the two sites that Barrick had originally determined yeah. were yeah. caught. So he changed specifically in generating his directed mouse adapted, right? So right. it tells you it tells you more about the interaction with the ACE2 and the RBD as being more conserved, right? Yeah. That's the so, thing. I Go think ahead, that sorry. that's more important versus the actual specific alterations. It tells you more about how the interaction involves, right? So you can make yeah. a chocolate chip cookie using 400 different recipes, but you still get a chocolate chip cookie. Correct. You can change RBD in a number of ways to get ACE2 binding. Right. Yeah, I understand it's random. It's not selected because there aren't human ACE2s in the bat caves. Right. So Random there must happen. be something else. But it also must be that the spike is pretty flexible, right? Yeah. Well, the spike has to be flexible, but we're also assuming that all these alterations are to do something to spike. We don't ever consider that they might be to compact the RNA genome into the particle or do something about You mean you uh, co changes in the spike coding region could have RNA yeah, effects as well? Yeah, they could have RNA yeah. effects, yeah. Sure. Now, nobody looks at that. You're right. Okay, uh, let's do a couple of emails. Hey, Dixon, I think you should take that first one. Yeah, I, I read it before. Okay, this email is from Sewell. Sewell writes, to the TWIV team, it is 59 degrees F with blue skies in Charlottetown. Charleston, South Carolina this morning. I have been an avid TWIV listener since hearing TWIV 598 in April of 2020 with the masked man, Daniel Griffin. <clears throat> you have been an incredible source of information for all things COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2. Moreover, you have stimulated me to begin to learn about viruses and immunology. In addition, I listen to TWIM and Immune. I have taken Vincent's course on virology and started Brianne's course on immunology. I am grateful not only for the information, but also for awakening my curiosity about science. As I was listening to TWIV 866, I picked up a small error by Dixon. Gee, not, not another one. 
<clears throat> this discussion was about Simon Flexner, whom Amy had said he graduated from medical school. That was like a mail-in catalog medical school, and that there were lots of things he did not know. Dixon commented that he knew a lot about medical education. Flexner, who knew about medical education, was not Simon, but his brother, Abraham Flexner. Interestingly, Simon Flexner graduated from the Louisville Medical College and was later absorbed by the University of Louisville. The curriculum of that school and others was improved by reforms stimulated by the 1910 Flexner Report by Abraham Flexner. And I guess the reason why I got that mixed up is because I spent three years at Rockefeller University as a postdoc, and there was a hall named after Simon Flexner, <clears throat> not Abraham Flexner. So uh, perhaps that's where I uh, made my miscalculation. Thanks again for the service that you provided the stimulation to our curiosity. I am a retired nephrologist of Dixon's vintage. What does that mean, vintage? As old as you? He's my age. He's my age. Okay. Our next email comes from Bonnie, who writes, I thought the TWIV crew might like to read Paul's latest opinion piece in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Thanks for all you do. Rich knows I'm a big fan. And this is Bonnie Offit, who sends a link to uh, Paul's article getting from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Getting back to normal life means understanding what COVID-19 immunity really is. And I have to just quote a few sentences from here. You know, he says, uh, how, how is the, our life going to change? When, when can we say we've crossed the line and live our lives as before? Uh, and he said it's going to depend on immunity induced by vaccination and natural infection. Both will pr protect against serious illness, but neither will be highly effective at protecting against mild disease, which causes a few days of fever, cough, conjection, and fatigue. Protection against severe and mild disease is mediated by two separate immunological processes. Serious illness protection is afforded by immune memory cells, which are long-lived. But they, the bad news is they take time to be activated to fight infection, too much time to protect against mild disease, which occurs more quickly after exposure, but plenty of time to protect against serious illness. Protection against mild disease is mediated by antibodies. The good news about antibodies is that they can be highly effective. The bad news is they are short-lived, lasting only three to four months after the last dose of vaccine. The goal of COVID vaccine, as is true for all vaccines, is to prevent serious illness. For most people with normal immune systems, two doses of mRNA vaccines appear to do exactly that, but not everyone. You need three doses for older people, people with illnesses, and so forth. So he says um, for protection, antibody protection against infection to last longer than a few months. You need another booster dose. This is not a reasonable public health strategy. We can't give booster after booster all in the name of preventing mild illness. To do this, to avoid this, we need to change our thinking about COVID. Up to this point, we've done everything to identify and isolate people who are asymptomatic or mild illness, a zero tolerance strategy. Imagine if we did this for other respiratory viruses like influenza. Two years before SARS-CoV-2, influenza caused 800,000 hospitalizations and 60,000 deaths. If we had a zero tolerance strategy for flu, we would frequently test people to determine whether they're infected and we'd give two doses of vaccine during the winter. This would lessen the risk of spread, but it's impractical. That's why we label influenza virus endemic. We have learned to live with the current impact of this infection. And then he find, he ends up saying over the next few years, a new a variant of SARS-CoV-2 might arise that results, resists protection against serious disease. At that time, maybe we'll need a variant specific vaccine, but we're not there yet. For now, we're going to have to realize it's virtually impossible to prevent mild COVID without frequent boosting. So let's learn to accept that the goal of COVID vaccines is to prevent severe and not mild illness and stop talking about frequent boosting. Otherwise, we'll never be able to live our lives as before. I think it's brilliant and that uh, we have said this for a while on TWIV as well. Do you like that, Amy? Yeah, I do. I like off it. I mean, I've said this for a year. 
I think it's cool that his wife sent the article to us. Yeah, I think it's great. <laughs> Amy, can you take the next one? Sure. Annika writes, Dear Twiv team, longtime listener, second time writer from Tokyo, 12C53F. I'm listening to the most recent episode, 6869, Epstein Bar Virus and MS, and Dixon's just joke. Of, but if you attack the astrocyte, you destroy Houston at one hour, 17 minutes, and nine seconds. Did not get much reaction during recording, but I had to pause for a solid gruff. I guess it's a laugh. Just sending my appreciation for a quality pun. Keep up all the good work, AL. I didn't get it when you said it, Dixon. That's okay. If you attack yeah, the right. astrocytes, I don't get it. What is, what is that? If you well, attack, attack the astro, the astro let's let's uh, let's do a little thinking. You've given up your interest in baseball, but the Houston Astros were the world's champion about three years ago. Oh, okay. So it was a play on words of Astros and Astro sites. Oh, I didn't get the Astros. I was thinking of Astro. Okay. I'm thinking of astronauts, and you know, Houston was the center. Yeah, for no, no, no. That's true. That's true. Those somebody. Oh, Annika, okay. Annika, she got it. Thank you, Annika. <laughs> A guffaw, Amy, is a very loud laugh. Exactly. Okay. Can, Dixon, can you guffaw? Not in my current condition, no, thank you. But I'll oh, guffaw sorry. sometime for you later. Dixon, can you take the next one? I'd be happy to. Uh, Miguel writes, Kiara, go to, um, go to Vincent and team. A very long-time listener, very first-time writer. <clears throat> You have been accompanying my workout sessions since late 18, uh, 20, 2008 when I discovered TWIV. In fact, at that point, I learned how to enjoy running again. Running for the sake of running or listening to music was so boring that I could merely run a couple of miles. I now run longer, most times going back home walking, exhausted, just because I wanted to continue listening to TWIV. You may, you may imagine how geek I look when I tell my family, friends, that I worked out listening to a virology podcast. Anyway, I just wanted to share with you an attached picture. My wife and I moved to New Zealand a couple of years ago, and you may imagine my surprise when I found out that Alan Dove had opened a photography study in Dunedin. Scientist, pilot, scientific writer, and expert in photography. Kudos, Alan. Keep up the excellent work you are doing. It has been fun listening to you for the last 14 years. Wow. And I'm looking forward to the next 20. Greetings from a virologist at the University of Otago, 9,265 miles away, where the current temperature is 51 degrees F, 11 C, just another sunny day in the south of the South Island. By the way, I might add superb, not excellent, but superb trout fishing. You've been? And there is an Alan Dove photography studio yeah, it's in funny. Dunedin. I approve. I guess it's a, this must be a different Alan Dove. Yes, of course. But um, maybe from the same flock. Alan wrote here, he and I have been in touch. Sometimes I get emails intended for him. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, Dixon, you went to New Zealand, right? I did. Many times. It's a beautiful place. Absolutely beautiful place. People are wonderful. The food's great. And the fishing's wonderful. All right, let's do some picks. Dixon, what do you have this week? Well, this is totally off the subject of science, but maybe not. <clears throat> the um, the wreck of the uh, Endurance, where um, Shackleton, uh, the polar explorer who uh, never actually quite made it to the South Pole, uh, was in competition with Amundsen and Scott. And... Uh, had to abandon their ship because it got all crunched up as the ice formed around it as they were setting out to try to discover the South Pole, uh, the origin that, that, that was in the early days of, uh, of exploration. And this ship was photographed in the throes of being swallowed up by these large chunks of ice, and then it sank, stranding them in, <laughs> in South Africa, in, in, in the South Pole for how long? And shows Shackleton made history by actually going out and finding a rescue party to come back and rescue his um, mm. explorers before they all perished. And he got back and, and 
saved every single one of them. Wow. <clears throat> but what happened to the boat? So the boat sank in 10,000 feet of water. And recently, two miles, through an wow. anonymous grant of $2 million, $10 million, uh, a team went down to where they knew the boat went down. And by using uh, battery-powered uh, robot um, exploring devices, actually discovered the wreck. And you can see the name of the boat on the back yeah, of this cool. wonderful picture that they took. And so now that's a historical site, uh, they're going to uh, make a documentary about it. And it's, it's quite exciting to see how you can tie history back together with all of the things that have happened in between and um, sort of uh, complete the story. It's like, you know, discovering the Titanic and that sort of thing. So I thought it was a fascinating news item. Wasn't They're there not. another boat, like, right yeah. off of, like, the Cape or something that's under controversy with the University of Rhode Island or something about where well, it went down? Was, I think there's tons of stuff like that out there. But the big ones are, of course, really the Spanish famous. galleons laden down with gold coming back from their plundering of South America. And because they had so much gold, they ran into a hurricane and they all sank. So now they're all over the place. And so people this, are is a, them everywhere. this is a wooden ship. And it's it is. not. It's a wooden ship. It's, it's preserved ship. because there's nothing to eat uh, wood down there. There's no wood eating marine organisms. That's correct. It's amazing. They have a picture of the rear deck. Amazing. And all these little spiny things swimming around. So they're not going to pull this up, are they? Oh, no, 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 no. This is a, um, this is a memorial to the, uh, to the um, I guess, sick to it of some people. You know, Shackleton actually went back. Mm -hmm. to the South Pole, and he died of a heart attack. So what happened? He, he got uh, his, it got stuck in ice. He was unfortunate? Uh, not the second time. No, no, he just... Uh, no, the first yeah, time. When the, boat, the boat got crushed by ice, yes, right? Yes, that's correct. That is and, correct. And be, why, was he a bad captain? He didn't know what he was doing? No, 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 no. No, no they, they, they got stuck in the middle of their winter. Oh. So the boat, they had no choice. They wanted to go off and discover the South Pole. That was their base of operation. But as you see what happened, the ocean surprised them and ate up all the available fresh water, the salt water around them, and then crushed the boat as it completed its job of sealing off the hole that the boat, boat made in the ocean. Yeah. So once again, the moral of the story is don't try to invade a continent in the middle of winter. Well, it might be. <laughs> I don't think they went in the winter. They went um, sometime before that. And then they were going to be there for a long time. Amy, what are you going to do? You got to have a way to go home. So you have to leave your boat. Somehow you have to leave your boat. But because it was not a, a metal hulled boat, it could not withstand the pressure of the ice closing in around it. So who got there first? Amundsen? Amundsen, yes. And, and then Scott got there and then died. Mm -hmm. And you've but been there then, too? Course, oh no, you didn't go. Your wife went. I've never gone to South, but, but my wife did. Huh. And she had a wonderful time while she was there, but she didn't actually go to the South Pole. She went near the South Pole. Okay. She went through the Straits though, didn't she? Oh, you have to go there. Amy, yeah, people, were, go. people were talking about this on the live stream last night after you left. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not such a I'm not I'm not big into boats and stuff. I was I said well I saw the Vasa in in uh, Stockholm which had sunk many years yeah, ago. I've, I've seen that on too. its first voyage and they pulled it That's up right. and it's amazing, right? It's cool. Yes, and it sank. You know, I was talking about that last night with my wife and um, we mentioned it as another boat that is well preserved. Yeah. And the reason why is because most of the water between Denmark and Sweden Above that, uh, as you start moving towards the northern part of the Baltic Sea, it's almost all fresh water mm -hmm. because all the rivers pour down into that area. Yeah. And they've only got 20 miles of a gap to go out into the ocean in order to get saline. So a lot of freshwater fish live in the Baltic Ocean. That's a mm -hmm. Baltic Sea. Amy, what do you have for us? So I have this article about the history of vaccinating kids all the way. So we've forgotten a few things and we've just repeat. I know it seems like we repeat history all the time. And so it's about like all the big vaccine campaigns and how there has always been hesitancy and uh, 
stuff. In some places, actually, like 30 years it took for all 50 states to recognize that you should be vaccinated to agree to vaccinate and started with, you know, polio through measles, talks about like, you know, HPV and then uh, the chicken pox vaccine and like how even today, like only three, st- three states plus the District of Columbia, like require children to be vaccinated against HPV. So, you know, there has been a total history of hesitancy and stuff and how we've tried to overcome it with the passing of laws and stuff. I think it's interesting because we're at the same we're at the same conversation now about whether or not you should vaccinate your kid for against SARS-CoV-2 infection. It's interesting, Amy, how many of the vaccines of the past have become routinely accepted but a new vaccine elicits the same gut level reaction as as if all the other vaccines were brand new also. But they don't hesitate to let their kids get vaccinated against, uh, you know, tetanus and all the other um, measles, mumps, rubella. But a new one, I don't know. We, we should wait till the science finishes. It'll never finish. Yeah, but like, for instance... Um like the measles vaccine came out in the 60s, right? And so Kennedy and Johnson were pro-vaccine and then Nixon let funding for free vaccines lapse in the 70s. So we had huge surges of measles infections. And then Carter and then it lapsed again under Reagan and then only Clinton did we give them out free again. And it took until basically... 2000 for all states to require measles vaccines for kids to go to school. So that's almost 40 years. Right. You know, and, you know, I hear people talk about how measles is benign and measles is not benign. Like my family has friends and I have a cousin who've been damaged by measles, like they're deaf or they're mentally incapacitated and stuff. And you have these people like, for instance, Jenny McCarthy, who comes up and she says, oh, I'd rather get measles any day than get a vaccine. And she doesn't understand the the danger of a measles infection. And so I guess like that's kind of a point. But my real point is, is that we haven't learned anything about history and we haven't learned how to, and when we establish a new vaccine, how to think in the, uh, think about the future, how we're going to combat the hesitancy that's naturally occurs. And it's not like it's not occurred since polio. I mean, every vaccine has been gone through this hesitancy phase where between when it was first released to where it was fully accepted or pseudo fully accepted is been like a minimum of 20 years. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's crazy. I don't get it because I've never seen a vaccine. I wouldn't give my kids. Right. I don't understand why and why it has to be politically motivated because as you were going through the free vaccine and no free vaccine, it's quite clear it's party associated, which makes zero sense. Well, it also makes zero sense considering the fact that Nixon is the one who waged the war on cancer and and yeah. and, and stuff. Like he gave a ton of money to yep. biomedical research in some fashion. But he so, also screwed up on his uh, support for the EPA. Well, yes, I didn't say. Uh, and, yeah, that's part of my complaint. <laughs> that's part of my complaint. Is you know. You know, he gave on this to, and he took, he gave in his right hand and he took yeah, away yeah. in his left hand. Yeah, that's right. Yep. No, that's good. That's a good article. Thank you. I, I'm going to read that. I really should subscribe to The Atlantic. Do you, Amy? No. I you have just, to say, I don't really subscribe to The Atlantic. Because you, you, you can just read some articles for free. That's how it works. I guess, I don't know. I like, this has been something like, you know, I'm interested, I don't know. I'm interested in the topic. So yeah, I read okay. a lot about it, but I don't know. Well, uh, my, pick, the details. my pick also has to do with kids and, and COVID. And I've, two, I've been trying to look at the numbers for how many kids are infected and so forth. So there are two websites that 
uh, I have, and they're mostly from Daniel. Uh, and the first one is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. It's called Children COVID-19 State Level Data Report. So these are publicly available numbers, and uh, they collate them all. And you can see um, they give a summary, and then there are links to full reports. So they have, for example, cum cumulative number of child COVID cases as of March 3rd. So it's just eight days uh, behind. Uh, 12 million total child COVID cases, the U.S., Children represent 19% of all cases. Uh, and the, you can look at the change. You can look at cumulative hospitalizations um, and cumulative mortality. So interestingly, um, this is 46 states reporting, uh, in addition to Puerto Rico, New York City. Did you know New York City was a state? <laughs> and, uh, and Guam. It is now. Um, some three states have zero child deaths and other states, uh, 0.25% of deaths are child deaths, but you know, that's not zero. So it's very low, but that's good. Anyway, so you can see those numbers and then you can get the, you could download the full reports, uh, which are PDFs periodically, and they have wonderful graphics on all of these numbers. And, um, I find it very useful. So everything I've told you is available as a graphic and they report it by state uh, as well. Okay, so that's one site I find very useful. And then the other is a CDC site uh, called, uh, it's at data.cdc.gov, pr provisional COVID deaths from zero to 18 years of age. Okay, and so you can, at the latest numbers are March 9th and uh, you can see where the data are coming from. And you can look at the numbers. So they have a table here, for example, um, zero to four years old, cumulative deaths in that age group are 336. And then five to 18 is 714, 19 to 44, then goes up to 40,000. And then you can graph them because you can, you can click a button that says create visualization and uh, you can make a graph of your liking, whatever kind you want to do. So uh, that's also good. And I think deaths are what's important. You look at deaths because I don't care how many people are infected because the infections, as we've already discussed, can be mild. So those are two sites that I think have useful data on uh, COVID and kids. Uh, we also have a listener pick from Andrew. Hello, Vincent et al. Catching up on episodes in southern Idaho where it's a balmy 27F, sunny, beautiful weather for flying. I heard the listener question in Epitope 855 on whether a vaccine could turn on cellular protein production and reactivate cancer. It highlights the important biological fact that our cells are always making a metric truckload defined as 2.2 imperial truckloads of proteins. And if they stop, we're in big trouble. X. KCD is fantastic and absolutely worth following. Randall Monroe has written several books, all of which are worth getting. In his book, What If? Serious Scientific Answers to Absurd Hypothetical Questions, he addresses a hypothetical question of what would happen if all of your DNA instantly disappeared. He uses both radiation poisoning and death cap mushroom poisoning as an analog, as both of these impact your cell's ability to synthesize proteins. In short, you have a brief phase of walking death where you function normally as your cells start to degrade, this is followed by dying horribly. I strongly recommend picking up all of Randall's books for entertaining scientific reading material. I thought this one was worth highlighting as it pertains to this concept of cellular protein synthesis and homeostasis. Best of luck to the listener who is trying to convince his friend to preserve her life. I'm still working on both of my parents and I'm hitting similar barriers. Cheers and stay safe, Andrew. P.S. This chapter is only in the print version and isn't available online. Pretty sure I have all the details right. But my copy of the book is currently being moved to northern Minnesota where it's a slightly less balmy 19F. I can't imagine having to convince your parents to get vaccinated. Amy, you actually helped them get vaccinated, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Did they object? I don't know. They're both scientists, right? 
Yeah, they're both scientists. No, one was, uh, one was you know, sh- one has active chemotherapy and um, was all on it immediately. And the other one um, threw out all the emails that that, I, that they had told him where what to do until I called and said, so what's happening here, bub? And then, <laughs> by that time, I guess the email trash was either overflowing or it had been emptied. So yeah, I just took care of it. Good for you. But Back, um, Dixon, do you have any vaccine hesitancy in your family? None. Very good. In fact, we're all boosted. Excellent. But uh, speak, uh, yeah. Speaking of emails, uh, Dixon, did you know that starting Monday we don't have to mask at Columbia anymore? Really? Yeah. Look at that. Excited to teach in a week. I think we have spring break next week, but when I come back to teach without a mask, it's been it's been two years. It has. I was, I was teaching this course two years ago, and after spring break, we never came back. It's amazing. Wow, that'll yeah. do it. That'll do it for Twiv eight seventy five. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twiv. You can send us your comments, your picks to twiv at microbe.tv. If you really enjoy what we do, consider supporting us. You can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. And of course, since we are a 501c3, your contributions are tax deductible. Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.org. Thanks, Dixon. You're welcome. And it was a pleasure as usual. And I learned a lot. Amy Rosenfeld is at enterovirus.net. Thank you, Amy. My pleasure. I might uh, see you next week. <laughs> you, you might, and it's not a not a bad thing at all. No. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week with another TWIV is viral.